the title is be bold, be brave, and be you. Be bold, be brave, be you. Let's give a shout to my Honda. <laughs>
because he's so scared. And that's what happens when you're caught off guard and you don't know what to do. You forget about everything you learned and you just start running. And he started running. And he thought, oh, that bear is pretty fat. You probably can't catch me, right? I'm a bear run hunter. He started running. And then after about 30 seconds or so, he, took, he looked behind him. And he realized, whoa, the bear's still running. <laughs> so he started going faster, right? And he thought, oh, God, OK, the bear must have stopped. So he turned around, and he realized the bear is even closer. <laughs> he kept running. So he thought, oh, my God. I think he ran as He probably set a world record. He was running so fast, he kept looking, looking back that the bear was just getting closer. And every time he looked back, the bear was getting closer. And he realized one thing. I should have listened to my coach. Now? I'm going to die. And nobody will find me, right? So he's just prepared to die. He's almost like you're running really fast, but then you realize you got to give up. He had that feeling, right? It just sank in his heart. He's running, and he realized, this is it for me, right? But all of a sudden, he was coming around a corner, and just a split second, he did something that probably nobody ever thought he would do, including himself. You know what he did? He farted. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of going around the bend, he jumped off the cliff. Ooh. Yeah. He didn't even know how far down it was, but he just jumped. Right? Because that's the only thing he could do, right? So he jumped, and when he jumped, it was pretty steep because he rolled down and scratched and rolled, and he had cuts all over his legs. And by the time he got to the ground at the bottom, he broke both his legs. Whoa. He had bloody and stuff, and he's going, now I'm gonna die, oh my god, what a terrible way to die, right? So he was looking up like this, uh, like this, and the bear just stopped. He just turned around, walked away. Because the bear probably thought, oh, Phoebe is crazy. I'm not going down there, right? <laughs> so he actually survived. And they, when they found him, they brought him to the hospital, and the reporters came and said, oh my god, Abidi, you got chased by a bear? What did you do? He said, oh, I thought I was going to die. I didn't listen to my coach. My coach told me about this, but I just didn't listen. I was just too scared. So what did you do? And Abidi said, I just jumped off the cliff. And the reporter said, are you crazy? And, I, and Abidi said one thing to the reporter that stuck in his mind. Abidi said, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> so the reporter was speechless. And so the reason why I'm telling you this is because if you ever was chased by a bear, okay, what would you do? Okay, and you know, in, in life, we will be chased by bears. I'm not maybe talking about a real bear, but we have bears in our life. It's the thing that scares you. That's your bear. And when something scares you and comes at you, it's most often times when you put your guard down. Because you don't think about being prepared. And most, most importantly, the reason why I'm saying this is because all of you in here, in this room, you are public speakers. You probably think, oh no, I've only been here three times, I'm not a public speaker. <laughs> I've only done one speech. I'm definitely not a public speaker, right? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if you've ever had a chance to stand up and say something, or even come here and do a speech, you're a public speaker. I don't care what level you're at, you are a public speaker. Because that's what public speakers do. You stand in front of the stage and you give a speech or you say something. Right away you're a public speaker. You can tell people you're a public speaker. Better not tell people how good you are though. <laughs> but you are. Okay, and so the reason why I'm telling you this is because as a public speaker, you have to be prepared to speak. But you don't know when you're gonna have to speak next. Like Amos might come to you the next day and say, okay, you're gonna join the speech contest. I'm gonna write your name down. But, but, no, I'm gonna write your name down. <laughs> or something can happen. You might come and say, oh, you're gonna deliver a speech next week. And you just, you don't know what to say, but you say, okay. <laughs> but then a week later, maybe the day before the, the, the club, you say, oh, I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done it, right? I've done it too, right? Okay. I, we've all done it because we get freaked out, right? We have time to get freaked out, and then we call Amos, right? <laughs> but, you know, look, we, we've all, I've been there, and I just want to tell you that I'm no, I'm no more special than you, right? A lot of people say, oh, how did you do this? How did you do that? It's no special secret. You just got to practice. 
And I don't mean just practice, but you gotta practice smart, okay? So as a public speaker, if you had to be faced with speaking at a club or area or division or district, and you knew you had to do it and you don't have much time, what would you do? You have to ask yourself this question because when you ask yourself this question, you have, you have time to prepare. Don't get caught off guard. And the reason why most speakers get, get nervous or they don't do well as they think they should is because they get caught off guard. And as a public speaker, that's the worst thing that can happen is you get caught off guard. So don't get caught off guard. So there are some things you can do. Look at all those eyes. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, and one of the things that I do is I, I coach my students to be public speakers. I have a program. I'm a personal coach for them, for public speaking. And I can tell you, kids have the same problem as us. They do. They're afraid of public speaking. As soon as they come up here, they freeze. Because, you know, when they practice their speech at home, they can say it 50 times, no problem. They can say it while eating. They can say it while doing their homework. Perfect. And they think everything's great. But as soon as they stand up in front of their class, they freeze. And it's because all those eyes are looking at them. And all those, they, they're thinking, what are they thinking of me? And that's when you get scared. So everyone's going to be scared. Like right now, you're probably thinking, is Mike scared right now? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I'm good at hiding it. I've practiced so many times, I know how to, how to hide it really well. And sometimes it's actually good to be a little scared because that helps you do better. And that shows, actually shows the audience that you are vulnerable. You are actually a human being. I'm not a robot. I'm not perfect, right? And I just want to let you know that if you ever go to a speech contest or any speech, don't be afraid to make mistakes because we're all so afraid of making mistakes, okay? Don't be afraid. The judges will forgive, the audience will forgive you if you make a mistake. But they will never forgive you for one thing. You know what that is? Can anybody guess? They'll forgive you if you make a mistake, but they won't forgive you for this one thing. Anybody don't know? Show up. <laughs> no, you're already here. <laughs> don't prepare. What's that? Don't prepare. Not prepared. No, no. If you are not authentic, you are not being yourself. They will never forgive. The audience will never forgive you. Because, especially if they know who you are. I know Mike. He doesn't act like this off stage. Now he's on stage and now he's acting and performing. He's like somebody else. We don't even know who this is, right? And oftentimes you don't even know, need to know that person, but you can often tell when they are uh, performing. Don't perform. Be yourself. You know, you, you, we are too worried that people won't like us, and that's why we start performing and being somebody else. Oh, God, now they don't have to see the real mic. I can just start acting. Like, you know, uh, the best actors in Hollywood are not the ones who act. The best, best actors in Hollywood are the ones that just be themselves. Really, think about it. So you just, when you get on stage, be authentic. And it's really hard to do, because when I coach students, they start performing right away because they're trained to be like that. Oftentimes, I even hear the teachers tell them, you gotta protect yourself. You always gotta protect yourself. You don't wanna get hurt, protect yourself. So when they get on stage, they try to be somebody else. They start performing. They're not like, they're not, they're not the student that you know. And it's really hard to deprogram somebody and train them to just end up being themselves. It's really hard. So that's why, like, for us as adults, it's probably going to be harder to train yourself to just be you on stage. With the kids, it's also hard, but because they're so young, uh, it's easier to deprogram them and brainwash them and say, just be yourself, right? And you, they, they have to start getting comfortable being themselves and not being afraid of showing people who they are, right? So here, I'm going to tell you something that you might not like. Okay? Now, this is very important, and a lot of people won't accept this, but this is something that I found that works for me, works for every successful public speaker I have met and spoken to. 
if you want to progress, you want to become a better public speaker than you are now, you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Okay? You have to be comfortable feeling <coughs> uncomfortable. Okay? Because it doesn't mean that you're bad. It doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. You know, when you're uncomfortable, accept it. Embrace it. Because that's when you are learning. That's when you're getting better. You might not feel like that at the moment, but later, you're going to realize, wow, I got better. Yeah, I'm going to try it again. You, you, have to, you have to enjoy it. So that's why sometimes when I don't even want to be on stage, I don't want to talk to people, I force myself to do it because I'm uncomfortable. And I realize that's the moment I'm going to learn something. So when I want to share something that is very personal to me or very sensitive, you don't usually share with people, I share it. I say, um, I don't feel comfortable, but I do it. But when I do it, I realize I'm uncomfortable, but I've learned something. And that person has also learned something too. So you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So I'm going to talk about quickly just three things that I found made me uncomfortable as a public speaker. When I was starting to learn to public speak, enter speech contests, come to Toastmasters and do speeches, I discovered three things that made me uncomfortable. And maybe you might be able to relate to some of this. Okay, number one is stranger training. I know you've never heard of this before because I made it up myself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> my experience, okay? And you will, you will one day have to do this. I hope you do. Stranger training is this. Uh, I when I first started, I had a coach. He coached me for entering the speech contest. And it was really hard because you know when you have a coach, it's different from having a mentor. Because a mentor can just give you suggestions. But a coach is basically they're not just giving you advice, but they're telling you this this works best. Try it. Okay, it's like if you're a basketball star, right? And I'm a coach, and I tell you, when you get out there, you gotta pass it to him, and he's gonna shoot it. And you get out there, you don't pass with him, but you shoot it yourself and you miss. The, what do you think the coach is gonna do? You're a superstar, but the coach is probably gonna say, you sit down. <laughs> right? So coach is there to help you. And I had a coach and he made me do something that I was super, super not comfortable with, okay? I was preparing for my very first speech contest. I got to the, the, the district level the first year. And that alone was super amazing because I was only in Toastmasters for 10 months, okay? But I remember two weeks before the contest, right? My coach was being so nice to me all of a sudden. I don't know why, because my coach is always so mean. <laughs> <laughs> and he took me to McDonald's almost every day, and, he said, yeah, you did a good job today. I know you know your speech well. Yeah, coach, I know it super well. I'm ready for this, right? I'm gonna just do it. I was so confident, like a baby. And then all of a sudden, you know, my coach said, does that feel good? I said, man, that was fantastic. Let's meet every day. He said, okay, now I need you to do something for me. Okay, go ahead, say You need to stand up now and do your speech. I said, what? We're having dogs. <laughs> You mean when everybody's gone? I said, no. He said, no, stand up now in front of all these people and start your speech. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Should I announce that I'm going to do it? No, just stand up and just do it. <laughs> I'm going to time you too. I said, oh my god, right? <laughs> it's most quick. I said, are you crazy? They don't even know English. What are they going to think of? Just do it. I got into a huge fight. I even walked out. I stormed out, right? But then later I realized, you know, he told me, called me and said, no, if you don't do this, I'm not going to coach you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so angry, right? And he said one thing to me that kind of, okay, I said, oh, I'll try it. Because he said, you know what, if they laugh at you, you'll never see them again anyways. Right? So just, just do it and run out. Run. I, I, I'll let you run out <laughs> after you do your speech, okay, if you get embarrassed. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. You know, I, I stood there. And, and people started staring at me because I was just standing there. There were lots of kids running around going on the slide and eating McDonald's, right? Couples and families. I just stood there. And then, if you know my first speech, uh, my first speech was called Get Out. So at the beginning of the speech, I have to run up, walk like this and go, Get Out! Right? <laughs> so I was like, oh my god, I'm going to be in trouble, right? So I stood there, I stood there and all of a sudden I just walked down to the aisle where the kids were playing over there, and I said, get out, right? And all the kids stopped at the playground, everybody looked at me, and I started doing my speech, right? And everybody was staring at me. <laughs> they were taking photos, videos. <laughs> I think some of the kids were so
saying, this, this man, what is he saying? <laughs> I, I was so embarrassed, you know what? I knew my speech so well, okay? But as soon as I did it on that at McDonald's there, I, I must have made 30 mistakes, I forgot my lines. Oh, I was sweating, it was the worst experience of my life. But I was uncomfortable. But I still wasn't comfortable, okay? But, you know, I finished, walked out, and, you know, after that I, I realized, wow, I did it, I can't even believe I did it. I embarrassed myself, but I did it, and I screwed up. And my coach told me one thing, he said, it's okay to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes make you better. And I realized right there that I gotta make more mistakes. So I actually went back. And I went back many times. And people started to see that I started coming back. So people started having McDonald's there just to wait for me and do my speech. <laughs> but I started doing this a lot. That's called stranger training. It's when you go and practice in front of strangers, right? I went to the park, I went to a university where the kids are walking around. I just stood in the hallways of my school. Right? I went anywhere where I could find strangers. And I would just stand there and I would just do my speech. Until I got to the point where I just didn't care what people thought about me. Right? I only cared about delivering my speech and being myself. And when I did that, I just became, I just, you have this sense of peace. And that's what you need to have when you get on that stage, any stage, you have to have that peace. Because that's when you know you're going to do a good job. People are going to go, wow. Where's your, maybe, where's your shirt? It says, wow. Right? People are going to say, wow. That's what you need to do. Every time you get on stage, you have to make people think like, wow. Like, they're going to remember you because you did something. Then that, that only happens when you are yourself. Everybody's different. You are unique. Nobody can be like you, and you are the same. She cannot be like you. Everybody wants to see you, not you acting like somebody else they don't want to see. They want to see you on stage because I can't be like you. And that's what you bring to this stage when you do your speech. Okay? So that's called stranger training. If you're too fair, afraid to do that, that's okay. Start <laughs> with your family members. Make your family members eat their dinner and do your speech. Uh, do it in front of your coworkers, right? Do it in the bathroom when people are walking by. Sometimes I wouldn't even have people watching me, so I would take my dog for a, out for a walk. I'd make him sit there in the parking lot and watch him. <laughs> be, you, know, you have to have somebody watch you. And if you don't, worst comes to worst, get a mirror and look at your face in the mirror and speak to yourself in the mirror. I like to do that. Some people don't. I, I like to practice in front of a mirror only because I can see my face. And if I make some kind of gesture with my face, I can catch it. And I'll tell you one thing, okay? Why people look in the mirror? It's because you want to see what you look like. Do I look good this morning? Oh, am I going to go? You want to know, make sure that you look good, right? And if you don't like yourself, then other people won't like you, right? That's what you think. That's why you look in the mirror. We all do it, right? Otherwise, we won't have mirrors. And it's the same thing. When you look at yourself in the mirror and you speak, right? If you don't like yourself, then you have to fix it. You can change it because you see yourself. And most often times, you're fixing something when you realize, oh, that's not me. Then you can catch yourself when you, like um, my students, right? They have a tough time smiling. They can smile, they have the best smiles. But as soon as they get on stage and you tell them to smile, they're like this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, that's not a natural smile. It is. I said, no, it's not. And I would tell them, you know, just relax. And I would talk to them and say, give me a smile that you that you make when you see your mom. And you should see the smile. I take a photo of this That's what you need to show them. They see your natural smile. And guess what? When I come on stage, I don't look at everybody. I tell my students that too. Only pick out the people that look friendly. <laughs> <laughs> look at them. Don't look at people who are falling asleep or they look grumpy or somebody's on their smartphone going, what am I going to eat for tomorrow? Do something, right? Only look at the people that are friendly because that will make you as a speaker better. So don't feel like you have to look at all the eyes out there. It just makes you feel more scared, okay? Look at the friendly people. Uh, the other thing is this, revise, revise, revise. Okay, I know some people never change their speech. That I, would, I used to be like that too. I would write something and I would say, Coach, masterpiece! 1,200 words, seven minute speech. And they'll say, no, you gotta, I just gotta cut it. I said, how much? He said, 
about half. Half? What am I going to cut? And he would just help me cut everything off. And I would be freaking out, we would have arguments, and I would realize later that when you revise, you are making the speech better. Don't be afraid to change your speech. Even if you think it's a masterpiece, it's not. You'll, you'll hear a lot of champion speakers say, when they delivered their speech and they became the champion, they'll often say, I could still change it to make it better. You, there's no such thing as a perfect speech. So when you have a speech, don't be afraid to change it. If you feel there's a really good line that you need to use and, and it's really funny and people will laugh, guess what? When you try it in front of a new club, that's why I like to visit new clubs. Because when I do my speech, I need people who's never heard my speech. People don't know me, and then I do my speech. And if they laugh, then I know, okay, I can keep that in. If they don't laugh, then I gotta take it out. I never do the same speech in front of my club 10 times. Because oftentimes, the general evaluator, they don't, they wanna be, they don't wanna be rude. So they always say, oh, it's, they always say, oh, it's good, it's good. It's not really good. <laughs> so sometimes they're too polite. So that's why I also get people outside of Toastmasters to hear my speech. And if, they give me feedback, it's often quite direct, but it helps me a lot. Okay, so you gotta revise. Do not be afraid, because speeches are meant to be changed. It will get better, and I learned that. So you might feel uncomfortable, but get comfortable changing things, okay? And last thing is this, yeah, share. When you get on stage, do not lecture people. Have you ever been to a university lecture? I often put on sunglasses. <laughs> put on my recorder and fall asleep. Because I don't want to hear a lecture. Because when I go home, my mom lectures me too. <laughs> so guess what? When I come here and I'm a lecture speaker, I want to hear that person share. That means it has to come from here, not from here. So if you have a speech, it must come from here, not here. So when you share, that's when the audience starts listening. You get a connection with that person. That person connects with you. That only happens when you share. That means you have to be yourself. You have to be vulnerable. Don't be afraid to share something that's very personal or you feel weak. Because guess what? Your audience is just like that. And they want to hear, oh my God, what did he say? Oh, that's when they have a connection with you. But if you stand here and be like a robot and put up this wall, people will fall asleep. And I remember the, the second year when I did my speech, right? I, I you, you can always fall back into the same traps of feeling like you are too good, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, I started my first gavel club. It's a Toastmasters club for children. And I had a high school group of kids. And I had them evaluate. And I thought, these kids, they don't really know. I'm training them, how can you train me? <laughs> <laughs> I did it anyways, and guess what? Everybody said it was good, except this one girl. She, she didn't look like she was happy. I thought she kind of looked like she was angry at me. <laughs> yeah, and later I went up to her privately and said, are you okay? And she said, you know, I can't believe you're telling us all this stuff that you did your speech like that. I said, what do you mean? But she didn't mean it in a, in a rude way. She just kind of shocked. She said, what do you mean? She said, well, I feel like when you did that speech, there's a glass wall right in front of you. Like we can see you, but you're not opening the door. When I heard that, wow. That was the greatest evaluation I got. But when she said that, that woke me up. So you can always get great feedback from the strangest places. That's why I say don't be afraid to do your speech in front of people you you might close the door to. Share with them. Share. That's what I mean by share. You'll find something good about yourself. Okay? So be comfortable being uncomfortable. These three areas here. Now. Uh, today, right, I can't tell you all the stuff that will make you a better public speaker. Now we get to the skills, okay? And there's so many skills you can learn to be a public speaker. It's not about just coming on stage and just practicing. No, you can't. That's not smart practicing. Smart practicing is when you train to be a public speaker and there are certain skills that you can build up as a foundation so you will speak better on the stage. So here are some of them. Please write it down. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> That's too much, right? So you know, I don't have a lot of time. So what I'll do is I'll just give you maybe one or two tips. And these are the basic step one and step two tips that I teach my kids 
when they start public speaking class for the very first time. I think this is important because, you know people always say, first impression is the most important. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Are you just saying yes or you really mean it? <laughs> okay, because I tell my kids the same thing too. First impression is the most important. As soon as you get on stage, usually the judges are listening mostly to the beginning and the conclusion. Of course, the, the body's important too, but the beginning and the end, that's when you make a really strong impact with the audience and the judges. So I always tell them, step one, do the five second hold. Does anybody know this? If you didn't go to my other one, did you? <laughs> Okay, five second rule is this. You know, you often see people come on the stage, they, people are clapping, and they walk on the stage, and oh, I mean, I they start speaking right away, even while they're still walking. <laughs> no, no, right? Some people, they just get on stage, and then they start talking right away. It's too early. No matter what happens, you never ever start right away. Because I'll tell you what, from my experience, being on the stage, so many times, this is what I saw. And, and oftentimes, you guys never see it because everybody's facing this way, right? I see all of them, including the judges. And this is what I've seen. I've seen judges on this. When you're actually here, doing your speech, saw judges using their smartphone. Mm -hmm. Judges are still writing the score from the previous person, right? And this judge is talking to this judge, and this judge is like, <coughs> they're doing something else but listening to you, and you are the most important person in this room, and they're not paying attention, and you just got on stage, so you know what I do? Uh, teachers, any teachers here? Okay, I don't know what kind of teacher you are. <laughs> you know, most often teachers, when kids are really loud, a lot of teachers, they just slam something. Oh, they just go, be quiet! They start screaming, right? Okay, I realize that never works. And in the speech contest, if the judges are not listening, they're not paying attention, you can't say, hey, judge, be quiet! Hey, get off your smartphone! You can't do that. So you know what I do? I've learned that this works as a teacher or public speaker. When you get on stage, don't say anything. Just stand there for five seconds. Guess what? If you don't speak for five seconds, that five seconds, do you know what the judge does? <laughs> gotcha. He's listening now. Right? Or he's writing the score and no, nobody's speaking and he just goes. They're listening with silence. So you gotta use the silence. And guess what? Some people will say, no, 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 you gotta speak right away. The timer, timer. Timer will not start the clock until you open your mouth. Or you do some kind of action, right? So don't do any action. Stand there, smile, and don't speak for five seconds until you hear that silence. That silence is golden. And when everybody's eyes are on you, then everybody's going to be. They're going to be listening. So use a five-second rule. It's called a five-second rule, okay? Everybody try it next time, okay? And smile. Don't, <clears throat> don't come on stage and wait five seconds like this. <laughs> smile. <laughs> you know how you try this? I want you to try this, okay? You gotta practice your smile. Smiling is so important. People think, oh, smiling is nothing. It's so important. You know, when you walk down the street and you see a stranger walking this way, right? And you walk this way. Taiwanese people, I realize, you know, Taiwanese people are very friendly. But, you know, they're so busy that they don't have time to smile. So when they're walking this way, I'll smile and go. And they go. <laughs> they smile back, they force themselves, but they smile, okay? When you smile, other people will smile too. That's, that's another reason why I always look at the friendly people because they're already smiling. I get the connection right away. So smile, okay? Now, I have another thing called the speaker sense, okay? The speaker sense is this. Most often times you'll see people, when they get on stage, they just stand any way they like. Hand in the pocket, or they lean on one foot, Right? Or they stand like this. Look at my feet. Okay. Look, you'll see a lot of kids do this. Um, adults do this too. Their feet go this way. I call it farmer's feet. You don't want to have farmer's feet. You'll see a lot of, I've observed this very carefully, and my coach also uh, helped me with this too. The little things that people and Toastmasters will not point out. 
And you know, when you watch a world champion speaker on YouTube and stuff like that, watch many of them, you can watch them. They all have this thing about, people always say, wow, you know these speakers, they just look like they have something, something special about them. They look so special. Well, what makes them special? It's all the little things that you don't learn, right? So here's one thing you can do. When, when speakers walk on stage, they walk really confident. They walk confident, like, oh, I own this place, right? When they get on stage, they turn, their feet should not be close together like this. That's performance. Don't put your hands like this either. And don't feel like this either. I'll tell you why. Because you look, you know when kids are being naughty, doing something, the teacher walks in, what are you doing? And they go, oh, nothing. <laughs> okay? Or they do this. When you show this part, that means to judges and public speakers, that's a no-no. Because when you show this part, that means you're hiding your, yourself. You're not being authentic. You're not being yourself. You're hiding something. So don't show this part. When you go like this too, you're hiding yourself. So when you're standing on stage, show the palms, okay? When you show this, you're showing the audience that you're being open and honest. That's why you see a lot of public speakers speak like this. They always show this part, okay? So speaker stance is when you come here, your, your feet should be shoulder apart and your toes should face straight straight. You stand, your arms, I can tell if uh, a person is nervous or not just by the way they stand. Because when you stand, you'll see people go like this or like this. Look at my arms. Uh, I'm wearing sleeves, so it's hard to see, but you'll see a lot of people, they tense up their arms. Right? That's the first place judges look. Ooh, he's nervous. And when that arm gets nervous, guess what happens? travels up your body, your whole body becomes nervous. Trust me, as soon as you start moving, you're going to be nervous. And you know what happens when you get nervous? The thing that you don't want to happen, you forget your speech. I'm dead. <laughs> Why? Because you're nervous. It's the, it's the, your main enemy is being nervous. So don't do anything that will make you nervous. Relax. Shoulder apart. Put your hands here, it's gotta be really relaxed. If your arms are super relaxed, your whole body's gonna loosen up. And your heart's gonna be beating like this because everybody's staring at you. I tell people, breathe deep. You're gonna force yourself to breathe slower. And then speak. You, you gotta relax yourself. Nobody can do it for you, nobody can help you. You're here by yourself, you gotta do it. So these are certain skills you gotta practice. It's called the speaker stance. Stand shoulder apart like this, look straight. These are things that make the great speakers great. They look great. And you can do that too. You have two arms and two legs, just like them. <laughs> Some of you are taller than these <laughs> world champion speakers. Hey, you look fantastic, right? There's all these little things that you can do to make yourself look great on stage, okay? So speaker stance, five second rule. Now, this is really, really important. Okay, it's called, show me the wow, like Amos' shirt, right? What does the wow mean? You'll find a lot of champion speakers, right? They always have the wow. That's why people think, wow, that speech was amazing, because they had a wow, okay? So I'll give you an example. Sherry Sue, if you know who Sherry Sue is, she was one of the world champions. She started on the stage, not like regular people. She started like this. Her back was to the stage, to the audience, and she said, uh, don't be afraid to turn around. But when she did that, people were like, wow, okay, that's different. People remember that, okay? Uh, Diamond Jaya, you guys know Diamond Jaya, Hederachi? Yeah. He's a world champion too. He started his speech by taking a flower out. It was so quiet. Everybody was like, they took out this flower. And then he said, you know, how we are different. Everybody's different. And sometimes the world, the world can make us feel terrible. And he threw the flower in the trash can. Everybody said, that's a lot. Lance Miller. Lance Miller just walked on stage and said, the ultimate question. <laughs> right? And everybody wants to know, what's the ultimate question? Everybody's listening. Right? Those are wows. Right? Darren Tay, he walked on stage, put an underwear on his suit. Right? <laughs> People laughed and said, what are you doing? They, well, they want to know. These are all little wow things, right? Uh, you gotta, you got to have a wow. 
Some people put it at the end, some people put it in the middle. I always find it works best in the beginning because that's when you want to capture audience's attention anyway, right? Put it in the beginning. So what can you do? Well, for example, you can use a quote that will make people laugh. Ask a question that will make people laugh. Share a story. Somebody said share about sharing a story, right? Start with the story. Great story. Like my bear story, okay? <laughs> state a fact. Say something. I don't really like this one, but you can state a fact, okay? Make a joke. You know what? A lot of people say, what's one thing that I, I should put in my speech that will make it just over the top, right? And you should at least make people laugh once in your speech. At least once. Okay? Because you don't get extra points for telling the best joke. There's no such thing, right? But guess what? If everybody, every champion speaker will tell you that making a joke and making people laugh at least once in your speech will do wonders for your speech because you're not, you're not affecting your score, but you're affecting the judges here. And that's what you need to get. People often say, oh, it's a numbers game. Oh, I need to get the highest number. No, you don't. You need to get the judges here. When you get them here, it goes on to the scoreboard. Okay? So you gotta make them laugh. Everybody likes to laugh, right? Okay, so make a joke. All right, now, so this is, do you know who this is, Oprah Winfrey? Like, so basically she's telling you to show the palm, okay? Um, I'll just give you an example of how to do the five second rule and the speaker's stance. Who was the second speaker again? Uh, she's not here. She's, not she's left? Yeah. Oh, no! Okay, <laughs> who, was, who was the first speaker? Vivian. Vivian, Vivian can you come up here? Come on up. <laughs> Okay, so you're gonna come over there. Start from over there. Yeah, just it's okay. Start over there. And start over there. And when I say enter, you just enter and you walk onto the stage and stand there for five seconds with the speaker stands. Okay, can you pull your mask down? Is it okay? Can you do that? Because we need to see you spot. You such a good smile. Okay. Ready? Okay. Don't look at me. Okay, now, do you see her feet? Do you see her feet? It's too close. More apart. More. There you go. Now your toes have to face straight. Because when you put your feet out a little bit more, it shows more confidence. Here, it's more like timid, okay? Your hands, look at that, okay, relax your arms. Okay, look over there. Okay, I want you to look at somebody that you feel is friendly, looks friendly. I know they all look friendly, they're most nice and friendly. <laughs> you see somebody? Okay, look at that person. Don't take your eyes off that person. Where, where who are you looking at? You're gonna look at only one person. Only one person. Yeah. Who? Who are you looking at? <laughs> okay, so start over there again. When you walk on stage, you're see what what I do is I already plan out who I'm look who I'm gonna look at when I'm walking on the stage. When you walk on the stage, the judges are already looking at you. They're not looking at you when you start speaking. So when you walk on stage, look at the person that you feel looks the friendliest, and I look at the, only that person when I walk on stage. So do that. Ready? Go. Walk faster. <laughs> okay, you gotta keep looking at that person that you think is friendly. Look at that person. Five seconds. And then you start speaking. But when you did your speech, what was the first line that you had? You can't, you can maybe do that at the club, but from now on, I want you guys to just imagine you are going for your speech contest. You never have to start by saying, dear fellow to never. Nobody does that. At the district level, even area, no, they don't start that. You start with a wow, or start with a question, or start just right away. You don't even need to say your name. We know who you are. Okay, go ahead. When is the exciting moment you feel in your company? Okay. Now, can you say it, can you say it in something where it's going to be like, oh, wow. Wow. 
<laughs> okay, fine. Okay, then at least when you start, you're gonna go, wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyways, uh, when you start your speech, always think of something that you feel can wow people. Okay? And then you see how she stood. She, she seemed more confident when she stood better than right? yeah. That's what you gotta portray yourself as somebody who looks confident. Okay? So these are things you just gotta practice at home or at work or wherever, all the time. You gotta practice all the time. Practice every day. Just five or ten minutes a day. Okay, okay so here. Nearing the end, I uh, just wanna let you know I do have a I do have my own coaching business and I coach kids public speaking at my school and outside. And these are some of my some of my students. And these are some of the kids that really, really, really make a big difference. So there's one student here. <laughs> he looks so miserable, doesn't he? Yeah. Right? He was like this for almost a year. Came to class like this all the time. And every day I would say, you are not being yourself, Milad. I know what you're like. And look at yourself. This is not you. And people, other kids will come and try to coach him too. right? And we just thought we're not making any progress. And then one day, he came up to me in private. And you know what he said? He said, why? Why just can't you just be yourself? And then I was just about to give up, and he said, I'm afraid. And I said, what are you afraid of? He said, I'm afraid that people will see me for who I am. Oh my God, that's what we want to see. We want to see that, right? We wouldn't want to see you performing. And you know, at that moment, that's when he realized he has to open up, and he has to just be himself, and he has to be willing to make mistakes. And from that time, he started really improving. And what, the reason why I'm showing this to you is because this is what he looks like now. He's totally transformed student. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, you know, don't try to be someone else when you get on stage. You know, even in our private life, we want to have friends so bad, so we try to become somebody that we're not. But deep down inside, you're unhappy. And they think, you know, people will know you're fake, right? You have, if you want to have good relationships with people, you have to show people who you like. If they don't like you, good. You didn't want friends like that anyway, right? And it's like that on stage too. People will accept you when you are being authentic. So be yourself. That's the biggest and most important thing you can do on the stage. Be yourself. So these are some of the students I have. I have a lot more. I have about 70 students. Uh, this is just one group that I worked with for about three years. They all started from the same place. I want to let you guys know, everybody was once a beginner. Remember that. I started, you started, you started, we all started from the same place, right? And started shy, started nervous, but like somebody said, if you keep practicing, develop your skills, don't be afraid to make mistakes, and be comfortable being uncomfortable, you will learn to be authentic. That is so important. Look at these kids, you know, I took this photo because I realized these kids, their faces right now, that's their being themselves. I tried to take this photo many times when they first started, and you should see their smiles. It's just all oh, good, so unnatural. I can tell they're not being themselves. But after almost, you know, two or three years of training, they just learned to become, yeah, just be themselves. Yeah. So this is the, thing that I want to share with you is that when you get on stage, when you get off stage, you've got to be the same person. Off stage and on stage. And in order to do that, you got to be brave. you got to be bold, and you got to be you. And that's it. Thank you.
Anyone? Yes. The English <coughs> question. What is cut off guard? What cut does that off mean? guard is what when mean? if something happens to you and you didn't expect it. Okay. It's like kind of like a surprise. Okay. You are not watching. Yeah, or like maybe you're a student and a teacher comes in and says, okay, we're going to have a quiz today. <laughs> you're cut off guard, right? <laughs> <laughs> like that. Song Okay, anyone? Any other questions? Yes. I find it hard to, like, when, when you want to be authentic, like you are giving your speech. Like, like when I'm writing my speech, I keep thinking, how do I make it authentic? Okay, that's a good question. Okay, so there's a point where we have to just memorize our speech, right? Right. Okay, so that's up here. but. When you practice it enough times, so many times, until you're just ready to throw up because you're so tired of it, right? There comes a point when you, that's why I say, like for me, when I practice my speech, literally right from scratch, I haven't even memorized it yet. When I practice my speech, I never practice it alone, ever. It does me no good. Because as soon as I see somebody, I get nervous. So what I do is, I read it out, I memorize it, and I always practice like that, having somebody stare at me, always. Because then, I start letting my guard down and stop being somebody else, I just become myself. You, you gotta, there comes a point when you have to in, internalize your speech. You do it so much that even if you, even if, you see, like you have, a, you have one line in your speech, right? Everybody thinks you have to say it exactly that way in the speech contest or speech when you come up here. It's not true. You can say it any way you like as long as you have said what you need to say, you can say it in a di different way and it still comes out the same meaning, right? It come, that comes from here. So when you say to somebody, I love you, you don't always have to say, I love you. There's many ways to show your love and say it, right? Right? So it's, it's kind of like this. You have to internalize it here this. So when it comes out, it comes out just freely. And if you lose your line, you can still keep going. And it just comes out. I know for a lot of you, it might think, oh, that's really difficult. But if you practice enough times in front of people and do it often, you'll know what I mean. It just, things just start to flow from here. It only comes from here when you do it alone. In your room, driving your car, right? always stays up here, that's no good, it has to come from here. That's why I always share personal speeches. I never make up speeches that are not true or some factual thing or lecture, I never do that. I always share a personal story. That way, it comes from here anyways, and people can relate to personal stories, right? And it just comes out better, yeah. So next time you do a speech, share a personal story. We all have stories. And any more questions? Oh, one. Wow. Yeah, Jesse, please. Uh, I'm currently coaching a student for a picture talk competition, and I would like to, you know, ask for your piece of advice. Like, how would you? What are your suggestions with regards to picture talk competition? Sorry. Picture talk? Yeah, you are going to talk. Uh, you are going to describe a picture for a certain amount, uh, number of minutes, uh, for a certain minutes. So, uh, what are your uh, tips to in, in terms of that kind of competition? You mean seeing a picture and then talking about it? Yeah, to talk to describe the picture. Oh well, table topics. I do a lot of table topics. You got you got to do. You know, you have to keep. You have to constantly come up here and. Put yourself in uncomfortable situations. You know, table topics is one of the most uncomfortable things you can do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but if you keep practicing it, right, you'll be able to describe anything, anytime, anywhere, as long as you keep practicing. Because you, you know, your mind has to think really quick. And when you get on stage, you have to think quick. If you forget your lines, you have to just keep going. You know, um, when I did my uh, my second speech on the district level. I stood up, my microphone disconnected. I didn't even say a word. It just disconnected right away. And everybody, I saw their faces, they're like, oh, oh he's dead. Right? <laughs> but I didn't stop at all. I just kept going. And I spoke without a microphone. I spoke louder, and I just kept going. And people were like, whoa, OK, right? 
because I trained myself so much, right, that it just, I just never thought about it. It just kept going. You've got to get to that point where nothing will catch you off guard. And it takes time to practice. But if you keep practicing, I can promise you, anybody can do it. You don't have to be talented to do this. Be a public speaker. You don't have to be talented. I know so many people that are ta more talented than me. But I'm going to tell you a secret. The, it's not the most talented person that wins. Okay? It's the person that works the hardest. And when, you, when I say win, I don't mean you have to be number one or anything like that. You have to feel like you are learning and growing all the time, constantly. And that's why I, I join speech contests all the time. It's because I want to feel like I'm learning and growing. That's more important than getting in the top three or whatever. No, that's not important. You have to learn and grow. And that means you're going to get better. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> I actually have two questions, but I'll ask them all. Uh, how do you coach someone who thinks their English is not good enough? Oh, good uh, question. <laughs> Keep Chinese people always say this, right? Yeah. How many people? Yeah. Oh, my English not Everybody. Good. Every time I go to a Toastmasters club and people introduce themselves, I didn't hear anybody do this here, but most of the time they say, my name is Jack, my English not good. <laughs> Why do you always tell people something bad about yourself? That's a very bad first impression. Even if your English is bad, don't tell people your English is bad. <laughs> They'll figure it out. Okay? <laughs> but don't tell anybody that. You all don't look, make yourself look down. I, I realize this. Real, I'm the perfect person to tell you, because you think my English is so good, I'll, I'll do better than you, right? It's not true. Because, you know, when I was in the top three, three years in a row, somebody always beat me. Always. And guess what? Those people were Taiwanese people. English as a second language. They beat me. And their English is definitely not as good as mine. They had accents. Their English uh, level wasn't as good as mine. But how did they beat me? I'm going to tell you as a public speaker, don't focus on English only. If you want to, go to a cram school. They think that that will make you a better speaker. It won't. If you want to be a better speaker, you've got to come on here. Come to Toastmasters and you've got to practice other skills. Stage movement, eye contact, vocal variety, right? Speaker stance, all these things, right? That they don't teach you in the cram school. This is public speaking, right? If you can do that better than the next person and that person has better English, you got it. <laughs> really? And I can say that because those people beat me. And I always just think, wow, is their English better than mine? And I realize, no, because they did other things better than I did. And that's why they won. That's why they did better than me. So I don't ever want you guys to think that you can never get on that stage one day. If you have a goal of getting to area contests, division contests, whatever level, right? Or you just want to learn and grow. Don't think that you can't do something. As soon as you have said to yourself that you can't do something, you've already lost. You are the own worst enemy. Don't say that. Don't believe it. Just do it. And you'll make it. Just, it's all about hard work. And that's why I realized I, as an English speaker, cannot focus on just my English to do anything. None. You, you and I, we start at the same place, honestly. Okay? So there's other things you need to focus on if you want to be better as a public speaker, not just English. Agreed. Okay, and the other one? Do you ever practice oh. in front of your mom? Sorry? Do you ever practice in front of your mom? My mom is in Canada. <laughs> but you know what? I send my I would send my videos when I practice, I would send my videos to everybody. And this is one thing that you should do if you ever go to a, a Toastmasters speech contest and you go to visit clubs. I like to visit clubs because I like to do my speeches in front of people that don't know me very well. I get good feedback. But here's the thing, I never have people, everybody, give me feedback. Because you'll realize that you can't listen to everybody's suggestion. And some suggestions are so awful. <laughs> and then you'll feel so bad when you leave, you'll feel like, oh my god, I am the worst speaker at all. Because you feel down, because there's so many people giving you stuff. I always say, please choose one or two um, evaluators. That's it. And that's what I do. And if you can't, go to another clubs and do your speech. Who says that you have to do your pathway speech only in this club? You know how many clubs you have in Taoyuan? 10? You said 10? Yeah, 10 oh. clubs in Taoyuan. I would go to all of them and do my speeches. 
practice, practice, practice. You pay the same fee. You can go as a visitor and practice. <laughs> yeah, that's what I did. You know, I, I pay one fee and I would go and be a visitor at so many clubs and I would practice my speech over and over and over and then I would realize what works and what doesn't and that helped me a lot. If you always do it in the front of the same people, you'll never get any good feedback. Yes? Okay, I have one question. You put your name, you're booking a speech in slot two months ago, one week before the speech. You realize you haven't put, you haven't wrote any single word. Will you call VPE to cancel that speech? <laughs> You're not asking for yourself. <laughs> I, I, um, I used to think that once I write my speech, I should never change it. But that's not good. Otherwise, why visit other clubs and get feedback, right? You have to be willing to accept changes almost immediately and, and change it. I, I changed my speech on average about 150 times. So that, that's not my question. Oh, sorry, yes. My question is, you book a, a speaking slot, oh, yeah, okay. but you haven't prepared, you haven't read any single word for that speech one week before your presenting time. Don't Will mind. you cancel it? No, I wouldn't cancel it. Uh, there, there have been many times when people have asked me to go and do a speech, and I said to myself, that second person that did the speech on the nothing, right? If somebody knocks and you say, who's there? Opportunity. Opportunity who? Opportunity only comes once. Right? You know, when your opportunity comes, don't say no. Say yes first and then worry later. <laughs> <laughs> because as soon as you say yes, you can't back out. Otherwise, people are going to say, oh, this guy, you know, he's a flake, right? Say yes first and then worry about it later. Be uncomfortable, yeah, right? Okay. Stand on the stage for five minutes and say. Yeah, yeah and you know what? This, this is what I learned: is uh, you can you can prepare so much, and there will never be a time when you get on stage and you say to yourself, "I am fully prepared." Never. You always feel like you're not prepared. That's your discomfort, right? But you shouldn't cancel. No, you just just say yes and just. Worry about it later and figure it out. <laughs> and if you come here, you know how many times I have screwed up my speech? Wow. You have, you guys have no idea. The place, the Toastmasters clubs I've been to, in the strangest places, the strangest clubs, the strangest people, and some people don't even know these clubs existed. These small struggling clubs. Anywhere, right? I would just go, right? And they would love to have me because they don't have any speakers, right? <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, honestly, I've been in car accidents, and I go to speak, and then I go home, I get a speeding ticket, I've had crazy things happen, right? And I'm still glad that I went to speak because there must be a reason why these things happen, right? And I said to myself, I'm glad I went because where can I get these kinds of experiences, right? So. Never say no, just take the opportunity, just say yes, whatever it is, and then work it out later. Don't work it out first and then say yes. There's never a time when you are fully prepared. Never, never. Yeah. Yes. Don't worry, we're going to do it again later. We'll write it down, let's speak, 
and then we eventually start writing things down, then we cut it down, then we record it again, say it, and then we cut it down again. Right? So it's like you can't just make one speech and say, oh, it's done. Just let it out. Whatever you're, you, you want to do as your speech, just let it all out and record it. All. No matter what it is. And then just listen to it, and then write down what the things you're saying is important, and then say it again, record it. And it would be like little chunks. And I think this is why like, if you really want to grow faster as a speaker, you can ask somebody to be your coach. Okay? Somebody who you feel that you want to get to. Maybe you, you feel like your goal is to become, get, get to the division level, right? Then find somebody who's been to the division, who's been to the division level speech. Okay, then you can find a person that's been there and say, would you, would you be willing to be my coach? And they can spend some time with you. Because when you get a coach, right? This is what my coach did. My coach would sit down and say, okay, we're gonna make a schedule. I'm gonna meet you on these days, during this time, and you have to show up. Because what that does is, it makes you more accountable as a speaker, and the coach also becomes accountable because they say, okay, I have to meet him. He's counting on me. So you build a relationship. It's not just a speaker that learns and grows. The coach also does too. It's mutual, right? And you're helping each other. He's becoming a better coach, and you're becoming a better speaker, and he's sharing with you. And he, you're sharing on how he can be a better coach, right? So sometimes it's good to find somebody who can help you that's been to where you want to be. Yeah, they can help you make the speech, okay? And public speaker, well, you know, I, I never said to myself that, oh, okay, now I'm a public speaker. I just, I just realized, you know, when I started, see, like when I first started speaking, the reason why I entered Toastmasters is because I used to be super afraid. More afraid than you, because I was so afraid, I would shake like when I stood in front of people. I still remember my very first icebreaker speech at Jungle Toastmasters, right? And there was like eight people there. I did my icebreaker when we had the old system. And I stood, uh, before I got on stage, I went to the bathroom and I threw up. I was oh, so oh, scared. <laughs> and then I wanted to go home, but the door was over there. <laughs> so I had to come and do my speech anyway. I was so scared. I went 10 minutes, I went overtime. And then when I sat down, I felt so great. And then that's when I realized, okay, I wanna make speaking as part of my life. Or maybe that's when I realized I'm a public speaker. So because anytime you come up, no matter how terrible you think you are, you're a public speaker. You just, we're all starting from the same spot. We're, we're all learning and growing. You, you can't focus on the destination. You have to focus on your journey. The journey is more important. So yeah, you're a public speaker too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, and due to a time limitation, okay. I think that will be the last one. Okay, all right, all right, yes, yeah. okay. Uh, you talk about making jokes. Yeah, can I hear you? You talk about making jokes. Yes. But what is like... Okay, sorry, not jokes, but I mean humor. You just said to yourself, Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Can you say it one more time? Uh, like, the dilemma between being authentic and being humorous. What is like, your personality? Like, you just have no sense of humor. It's not humorous. So how can you be authentic? I believe everybody is funny. Everybody is funny. But, this is the thing. If you already said to yourself you're not, you don't think you're funny, you've already lost. You will never be funny. You will never come up with anything funny because you've already told yourself you're not funny. That's what I mean. So don't ever tell yourself something negative that's already strike one. And here, this is one thing I realized is yes, you should be saying something humorous at least once. Even It doesn't have to be people laughing like crazy, just even making people giggle. That's humor, okay? But I realize this is, some people like to try to come up with a joke, right? And write something down. That's when the joke comes unnaturally, okay? You are the funniest 
when you are sitting down at a coffee shop with your friend and you're just having a conversational chat, really relaxed, and you might say something and your friend laughs and says, that's funny, right? That's genuine humor. And so if you wanna say something funny in your speech, it has to come naturally. Don't force it, don't push it, don't try to make yourself say something that you think is funny. That's when it doesn't, never becomes funny. So that's when sometimes the humor comes last. In your speech, if you can't think of anything, just leave it for now. And it'll come later. Let it come naturally. And that's why you have to say your speech over and over until it, it's been internalized. Then the humor will just come. And then somebody will laugh and go, oh my god, and then you write it down. It's gotta come naturally. Don't force the, the humor. That's what I used to do. That's why actually those little things that you feel are funny and nobody laughs, they're called little darlings. You know, little darlings, something you really hold on to, right? You think it's funny, but nobody else does, and you don't want to let go of it. No! <laughs> you gotta laugh, how come you didn't laugh? Oh, no, I'm gonna keep it, something's wrong with that. No, you gotta let go of it. And just, if nobody laughs, let it go. And then just keep doing your speech and until it flows naturally, and then all of a sudden you'll say something a certain way that you never said it, in a way before, and then somebody will laugh. And that's the humor you have to try to get. That's why you gotta practice a lot. A lot. Yeah. Hope that helps. Yes. Yeah.